Romans chapter 13, starting with verse 8. I'll be reading from the King James Version. I want you to follow along in the text before you. Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it's briefly comprehended in the same, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envy, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, shall we? <clears throat> Preparing our hearts for the study of God's word. This is done by confessing all known sin before the Father and then asking that the Father might teach you. This is done in the secrecy of silent prayer. Father, we count it all joy to open up the Word of God and to read it in our own tongue, to hear from your Spirit as you teach us and as you guide us directly. Thank you, Father, for that. Thank you that it doesn't rely upon the notes that I have before me, but that it relies upon the power of your eternal Spirit speaking to the hearts of each of these men according to their need and according to what needs to be taught. We pray, Father, that you might be honored that you might be glorified in all that we do. For it's in Jesus' own name we do pray. Amen. We've come, last week we looked at the, in relation to authority, verses 1 through 7, and now we come in light of the future, verses 8 to the end of the chapter. And our first point is the commandments of the Lord, verses 8 through 10. Uh, verse 8 says, Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Here we have the present imperative with a negative me, which uh, forbids the continuance of an action that's already going on. It's a stop owing to anyone, even one thing. It's talking about an action that is already occurring, the, time, the uh, uh, loaning out or the owing to individuals, um, finances or what have you. And, and he's saying, don't continue in this. Stop it immediately, uh, is the way the verb is placed in the sentence. That is, don't continue owing a person. We would think, Pay your debts. The language of the King James Version prohibits the Christian from contracting legal debts, such as mortgages, such as business loans, buying your car on cash rather than on a loan. That's how it reads here, doesn't it? Did I, did I read it funny? Oh, no, man, anything. Can you take it any way else? I think we need to stop for a moment and look at this text. Commentaries have gone off crazy. I mean, in all different directions, but they always come back justifying their auto loan and their, and their mortgage. The word owe 
in verse 8 is the verb form of the noun that's translated dues in verse 7. Look, look up. Render therefore to all their dues. A due is something that um, is owed to someone. The connection between these two statements is direct. I don't think that there is that him using the same word in two verses disconnects these verses. Yet nearly every commentary I have on my shelf at home disconnects this phrase from what was said in verse 7. Why? I mean, he's saying, render therefore to all that are owed. Owe no man anything. Render therefore to all their dues. Give dues to no one anything. It's the, it's the same Greek word, one in a ver verbal form and one in a noun. Isn't that the same to pay your mortgage on time and pay this and that on time? Oh, wouldn't that be nice? And a number of <laughs> and a number of um, commentaries even made that suggestion, which just tickled me pink, because I realized they hadn't studied verse six and verse seven. The moment you've studied verse seven and you see the word used, and now we see it used again, you link the two together and you cease to have any problem. The connection between those two statements, I say again, is direct. But too many Bible scholars um, infer that Paul is jumping from verses 1 through 7, Christian responsibilities to his civil government, and jumping from there to verse 1 of chapter 8, private indebtedness, and then before the verse is even over, he switches to love for our neighbors. You know what we talked about last week? We talked about civil disobedience. We talked about obedience to civil authorities. And now he ends that with the render therefore to all their due, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom is due, fear to whom fear is due, honor to whom honor, oh, no, man, anything. And then he switches. But to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Yes, a lot of the commentaries begin to talk about mortgages and loans, and if you paid them off on time, that really isn't owing anything. <laughs> wonder if the bank looks at it in the same way that those those men do I gotta mention this because in this very common we're using the word debt debt uh oh white has a B in it how do we have the word debt and not and, and have a B in the word? I looked that up because we get our word from French word. Get it? To owe so, somebody something. To owe is the French word debt. And what do you say? Debt. And why do you put a B in it? You used, we used to, Anglo-Saxons, when we picked up this word debt from the Frenchman, um, we probably didn't have any debt until the Norman invasion. And after the Frenchman got here, then we all of a sudden had to owe, owe things, and we took their word debt. But then later on, our English teachers had to get uppity uppity and they loved oh, they loved Latin words and that's why much of your language is inundated with the Latin language and so they found out hey you know the 
the Latins have the word debitum. Debitum. Cool. <laughs> There's a reason for the B. Deb B. B. Tum. So we took it from them and gave no reason for the B, except that we can say to ourselves, this really came from the Latin. I mean, we're classy people. Yeah, I had to had to share that one. So, by the way, um, the day is away. Habere in the Latin to have to give what you have away is a debt. I'd like you to take a take a second and look at that handout that I I put on all your tables. Grab one of those things. Have you got it memorized already? I want you to see, when I say, oh no man, anything, how awkward that is until you start looking at the verse in front of it. Because if indeed it says, you may not have a loan on your automobile, you are forbidden to have a mortgage on your home, <clears throat> cut up your credit cards, do you understand where this is going? And that's not what Paul's talking about since he didn't have a credit card, a home loan, or an auto loan, all right? We, we know that is a fact. But I wanted you to see this. The, I gave you a picture of one page from the Codex Sinaiticus. And I will put that for those that love that kind of stuff. Codex is simply saying, English word, book. Okay. Something that's put together, sewed together, a book. And this codex is found at, in the Sinai Peninsula. So Sinai, Picus, to make it sound Latin and sophisticated as Englishmen love to do. <coughs> This is also known, uh, you'll see it in, in manuscripts and such. They'll use the, the uh, Hebrew letter, A, Aleph, Aleph, first letter in the Hebrew alphabet. And um, it's uh, identified as that because it is, by putting an A on this thing, another designation for it is O1, okay? The reason they're giving such high names to these things is because this is number one. We had a lot of manuscripts on the Bible of which the King James Version utilized. It utilized the Textus Receptus. And the Codex Sinaiticus was not even in existence at that time. Um, it was written in the fourth century, that means the 300s, and it was written under the command of Emperor Constantine, who wanted Bibles um, written and put throughout all of the empire so people would know what Christians believe. And the Codex Sinaiticus was one of those um, books that were handwritten. So it, we know as a fact it has to be after 325. Why? Because AD 325 is when the emperor became a Christian. And since it was from his command, we say it's probably in the middle part of the fourth century AD. It was written on vellum, and vellum comes from a Latin word, vitulium, which means made from a calf. And the picture that I gave you, this is actually the size of that piece of paper. Yes, it never does quite look right when they make pictures of them, but this is one page. And they would put eight of these pages together 
and side by side so that you could start reading over here and get eight columns, excuse me, four columns, and then turn to the next page and you would have four more. So you could look at eight. The purpose of, of this codex style was it's the first step away from a scroll. Scrolls were nasty little things in which you had to row, 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 and try to find the place. Interesting passage in scripture talks about Jesus doing that very thing in his own synagogue where he turned to a particular passage in Isaiah. A particular passage, read it to them, and stopped before he finished reading that verse. He knew precisely where it was. Most people had no idea. They would just have to keep reading in the scroll. But in a book, you can throw, like you do, you can throw the pages. This was found at St. Catherine's Monastery on the Sinai Peninsula in 1840. It was found by a fellow by the name of Konstantin von Tischendorf, good German name. He was representing the Russian Tsar, Alexander II, in his quest for finding books, <coughs> old manuscripts. And the Tsar said he wanted it. So the Tsar bought it from the monastery and uh, ended up in Russia, and then it finally ended up in England. That's about as much as I need to tell you about this picture over here. Except look here, and this is this verse. Verse six starts, for, for this cause. Um, you know, I read this at home very easily. Um, pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. Render therefore to all their to all their dues tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor, owe no man anything but love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, and on. Can you read that? That's what the Greek scholars have to do with these, because it's all in caps. And it's all run together. And words are broke to go to the next line, because they kept it very neat and tidy. Um, you see some other writing along the, the side. One of, one of the others made comment. You see some writing along the side. Those are corrections, where scribes have been been uh, reading through and they go, oh, here's an error. They spelled, they misspelled this, and he spells it correctly in Greek on the side. And they read and read. Oh, oh, oh. What he meant to say was this, and it, those are spelling corrections for the, uh, the guy that was writing the original. So this, understand that when they're deciding as to where to put chapters and where to put verse numbers, where to put a period, where to put a comma, quotation marks, all of that is interpretation. All of it's interpretation. <clears throat> And sometimes if you put a comma on this side of the word, instead of on that side of the word, it changes the meaning. There is interpretation that goes on when these Greek scholars are translating the scriptures. You need to see that. And I believe this is where um, scribal error came in. Because if O was at the end of the word honor, give fear to whom fear, Honor to whom honor, owe no man anything, but love one another. You would understand, ah, he's talking about the give the dues to those people. And he's talking about the dues as he as he does that. Do you see this? So, Averill, I don't believe that, he, that he's saying anything about your car loan. 
or your house payments. I don't believe he's talking about debt other than moral debt in reference to those who are in um, position over us. Give tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom is due, fear whom fear is due, honor to whom honor is due, and owe no one anyone, anything. Make sure that you pay that those dues and you pay them completely. Dr. Alfred, Greek scholar, says, pay all other debts, be indebted in matter of love alone. This debt increases the more, the more it's paid, because the practice of love makes the principle of love deeper and more active, unquote. Notice carefully that it is love and not doing the law, which is the fullness of the law in this verse 8. He that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. It's by love. And then verse 9, look at this. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment or the fulfilling of the law. The Ten Commandments can be divided into two sections. We see some of those Ten Commandments listed in verse 9, don't we? Um, it can be divided into two sections. The first section emphasizes the phrase, the Lord thy God. And the last five verses emphasis, emphasizes the word thou. Try it sometime. Go to Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through um, 17. You'll see the first five are to the Lord thy God, and the second, thou. And the first summarizes our duty Godward. And the last five commandments summarize our duty toward other men. The command to obey parents is included in the Godward commands. Why? Because parents represent divine authority to their children. In each of the two sections, the commandments deal with the realms of thought, word, and deed. Um, I was going to give you this. Uh, I'm just nervous because I started late. Um, yeah. The first five commandments is the Lord thy God. The second five commandments are thou speaking to the reader. First with one and two is thought. Then comes verse three, and that's word. And then four and five, it's D. And then it reverts right around. Six, seven, and eight is speaking of deed. Verse nine is speaking of word. And the tenth is back to the subject thought. You can run that through on your own from uh, Exodus 20. Now, why did I share all of that information with you? Well, simply, when it comes to the Ten Commandments, 
we don't see all Ten Commandments listed here. Actually, we see six, seven, eight, and ten in this listing in verse nine. It gives us those. Um, if you have a King James Version, you have one more, and that is the ninth one is listed. Thou shalt not bear false witness. That phrase there is not found in any of the old Greek manuscripts. The Sinaiticus that I just mentioned to you doesn't have that phrase in its, in its Bible. Why? It was added by some scribe who said, whoa, people, you see, he's talking about the thou passages. He's talking about the last ones. And he mentioned six, seven, and eight, even if he didn't do it in order. And then he mentioned 10. Well, you should have nine in there. And so the scribe, for your sake, wrote the ninth commandment in there. Um, Thou shalt not bear false witness, just to help you out. But the significance was, is that he's talking about deed and thought. He's not talking about word. That's why I gave you all of this, how the commandments are actually put together um, in, a, in a memory order. Um, Jesus, when he did, dealt with these, he cuts it down to two. When he looked at these 10, he cut, it, cut the commandments down to two. Remember he said, the first of all, the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, Shema Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. This is the first commandment, and the second is like it, says Jesus. Namely this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these, says Mark. Mark chapter 12 and verse 29 and following. Then Jesus added, on these two commandments hang all of the law and the prophets. The words, thou shalt not bear false witness, just simply are not found in the best Greek texts. And the reason they added it, uh, I think I, you can see well, he did this, surely he needs to throw this one in. It was just a little too much for the scribe. The order is also given as it's given in our text here. If you notice, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt uh, not kill, thou shalt not kill, um, steal, and then the tenth, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Um, He's got them out of order, but it's curious to note that Luke chapter 18, verse 20, likewise put them out of order. Look at this, Luke chapter 18 and verse 20. Exact same order as given to us by Paul in the book of Romans. Luke chapter 18, Luke 18 and verse 20. Jesus says, Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Number nine. Honor your father and your mother. And then notice over in, in James chapter 2 and verse 11. He likewise changes the order to the exact same order that these other fellows do. James chapter 2 and verse 11. For he said, do not commit adultery. He said also, do not kill. Do not commit. Um, now, if thou not commit adultery, yet if you kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. So speak ye and do as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. The exact same switching around the order is used in both Luke and James. So possibly that was how Jewish people memorized them. Maybe they memorized them in a different, a different order than what we did. The word in 
in verse 9, that word comprehend, is from the Greek word to sum up, to repeat summarily, to condense and make it a summary. And in this saying is the word logos. Um, I differ with the way that the King James translated this in verse 9. It says, in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. In this saying is the word in, E-N, in, and logos, word. So Averill translation in verse 9 would be, it is briefly comprehended in one word, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. In, you can translate it in one word, simplify it, thou shalt love your neighbor as yourself. Divine love produced by the Holy Spirit, a self sacrificial in nature is that aga that is used in this text. Denny commented, this is all that is formally required by the law as quoted above. Therefore, love is law's fulfillment. Just as he had said um, in verse 8, had fulfilled the law. And verse 10, love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. So he says it's formally required by the law is quoted above. Therefore, love is law's fulfillment. It is apparent, says Denny, once more that nomos, that's the word law, is Mosaic law and not law in general or civil law as we were talking about in previous verses. From the prohibitions are derived on the ground of which the apostle argues, to it, therefore, we must apply his, Paul's, conclusion. Dr. Weiss translates this verse nine. For this you shall not commit adultery. You shall not kill. You shall not steal. You shall not covet. And if there is any commandment of a different nature, in this word, see how you took that phrase in one word. In this word, it's summed up in this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. <clears throat> An underlying foundation of Judaism is the law. And the underlying foundation of our faith in Jesus Christ is love. Verse 10. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. What a phrase. Love is the fulfilling of the law. The commandment about loving one's neighbor as oneself is taken from Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. Leviticus 19, uh, 19 verse 18, which reads, But thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, for I am the Lord uses Jehovah there. I am the Lord God. This Old Testament passage is found at the close of a series of injunctions or commands as a description of how the individual ought to act in regards to those with whom he lives. Whereas, get this, the Old Testament implies that love is the fulfilling of the law. This verse, verse 10, in front of us, makes this explicit. Love clearly shows the believer's positive commitment. Love clearly shows the believer's active obedience to the Lord God. And then number two, as we looked at the commandments of the Lord, now the coming of the Lord, verses 11 through 14. Let me just read verse 11. And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awaken out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. Let me pause there. The doctrine of the Lord's imminent return is vital 
to our faith. And it is vital to our holiness. You say, whoa, where do you get that? Well, 1 John chapter 3 and verse 3. 1 John 3, 3 says, Every man that hath this hope in him purifies himself even as he's pure. Turn over there. It isn't that far away. John chapter, 1 John chapter 3 and verse 3. I want you to see this. I'm just going to jump up one verse ahead of that. 1 John chapter 3, and I'm starting with verse 2. He calls us beloved, favorite term for us. Beloved, now we are the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, his second coming, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him, what hope? The hope of Jesus Christ returning and us being changed in a moment when we see him. Everyone that has this hope <coughs> in him of the second coming purifies himself, even as he, Jesus Christ, is pure. The belief that Jesus Christ will return, and he could return at any moment now, is sufficient for you and I to have a transformation. This transformed living that we're, that we're talking about under this topic, to have a transformation in our living to holiness, to purity. Friend, if you really believe that Jesus was going to return before you got home this evening, do you think your behavior would be any different? Do you think your priorities would be different about your plans for tomorrow? Understand, our lives are transformed. He says they're made pure, they're made holy by the belief, believing in your heart that Jesus Christ is coming back. So I ask you, do you have this hope in you? Truly, do you believe Jesus Christ is coming back soon. If the answer inside you is yes, then understand this. Everyone else will see that too. They'll see the difference in you because of your strong hope on Christ's return. The prospect of the Lord's soon return should be a great incentive for holy living. Paul tells us four things that we need to know and do in the fact that Christ may return at any moment. I just listed them out here. First, watch vigilantly, verse 11, verse 11. And that we know the time that now it is the high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. Every passing day brings the dispensation of grace near and near, um, brings us closer to the end time, and hastens the return of the Lord. He says in, in verse 11, And knowing the time, that now it is high time, 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 Englishmen are kind of um, hampered in some time, uh, some ways, because of the limit of their words. And this is one time in which it is, interestingly enough. Because those two words, time, are totally different words in the Greek language. And knowing the time that it is now is not chronos. Normally when you see time, you see the word chronos. Um, uh, that's the time on the clock, is, is chronos, okay? Um, some of you that like watches will recognize the fact that that word chronometer gets worded there. 
because it's literally, it's actually measuring the time and such. But that's not the word for time here. And it normally is in most, most times when we see the word time. But it's karyos. And karyos is, we would probably use the word season because we would be talking about a period of time. Okay, uh, from July through November, that's talking karyos, okay, uh, for time. Uh, you could actually, in this place, write the word due season. That knowing the due season, that it now is high time. Oh dear. Let me, let me pause for a second. Um, Denny defines not the time abstractly, but the time they live within the moral import. It's critical place in the working of God's design. It's time, patios, um, season, is a critical place in the working out of God's design. It's time regarded as having a character of its own, full of the significance for them. Whereas the other word, the, that now it is high time, is ora. Okay. Do it in English. Okay. Ora. And this little Dealing Bob above lets me know that I put an H there. Hora. Hora. The hour. Okay? He says, it is the hour to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. All right? So knowing the time, the season, it's now the hour. Don't, don't look for a, a better time. It's now the hour to awake out of sleep. Um, that word soup. These are just too much fun words, okay? I'm sorry. I, forgive me. I, I do. I get carried away. Because I do my study here in the, in the Greek, and it just has so many fun words. And I go, oh, I know that word. Um, and you'll probably say the right. Sleep. That's used in this text right here, in verse um, 11. Is the word, English letters, who knows? And this particular one has little Doing hickeys on the front that does the same thing as this, and it makes an H. And the Y makes a U makes a. The word there is hypnos. Hypnotize. Wait a minute. That's not the sleep I had last night. I was not hypnotized last night. Do you see the difference here? It's right the hour, right now, to awake out of your hypnotic trance. You have been lulled to sleep. You have been made so that you are not looking rationally at the things on your YouTube or the things on the news or the news is a four-letter word. Always keep that in mind. It's a dirty word. And because doing, reading it doesn't help you. Do I hear an amen anywhere in this crowd? <laughs> reading the news doesn't help anyone. Do you change, do you change the news? Does it modify? It does make your stomach kind of uh, get sick, 
periodically when you see things, it makes you sick. But it does not make you a more Christ-like man. Get into the words. Get into the word, and then you find it. I think I got off my track. Well, that's okay. Because he says, now is the hour to get out of this hypnotic sleep that you're in. For our salvation is nearer than when we believe. Oh, beloved. Salvation is used in the Bible in three different ways. Different ways. It's used in the past, it's used in the present, and it's used in the future. There's a salvation in the past, there's a salvation that's going on right now, and there's a salvation that you will and I will experience in the future. The salvation in the past is justification, in the present, sanctification, in the future, glorification. Okay? Past, justification, the removal of our guilt, our penalty for sin from the believing sinner, and bestowal of righteousness that comes from Christ Jesus himself is occurring at the moment you believe. That is something that happened when you received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. In the past, you were justified. Just if you had never sinned, you take on the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And then the second is present sanctification. What's going on right now in this room? The continuous process by which God's Holy Spirit puts sin out of our lives and produces His own sweet fruit within us, gradually conforming us to the image of Christ. What's the reason we come together? Well, each there's a reason that we gather together, and that is you have a ministry to each other and other people in this room. You are here to perform a ministry to those other people. And likewise, you are receiving from the ministry of the people around you. And that is the process of sanctification that's occurring within our lives. And then future, yeah, glorification. The transformation of our bodies at rapture into a perfect body, a brand new nature. This is of the last that Paul is speaking. This is what he's talking about here. He's saying, wake up out of your hypnotic state for now our salvation, the salvation, that glorification, the return of Jesus Christ and the transformation of us in a bodily form is nearer than when we first believed that it's a justification. Did you see that? Now is the completion of our salvation, says Paul, nearer to us than the day in which we placed our faith in Jesus Christ. And then, not only watch vigilant, but war valiantly. Verse 12. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let's therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. He says, night is far spent. The day is at hand. The word is egg giso which is to draw near. It's approaching. It's in the perfect tense. He's not saying it's approaching. He said, it's right here. The night far spent, the day is at hand. It's in the perfect tense. Right now, we're experiencing the day. Let's therefore cast off the works of darkness. Let's put on the armor of the light. That cast off is is really sling it away. It's it's not take it off and fold it up neatly or put it on hangers for your wife to be happy with you. It's throw it away. Those things um, are works of darkness, works of evil. Sling them away from you. And he says, let us put on the armor of light. It's a really lousy translation. Because the word is horrible. 
you know anything about Greek soldiers and such like that, that word will come to mind. The hoplites that fought. But this hopla is in the plural. It's not armor. I hope you have a modern translation that has something else somewhere. The word hopla is weapons of war. Swords, shields, all that kind of stuff, okay? Weapons of war. Put them on is enduno, to put on as a garment, to clothe oneself with these weapons of light. Pretty neat picture here. Um, yeah, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11. Just a few verses, a few pages over, right? Um, <laughs> <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 11 we read put on the whole armor same word weapons put on all the weaponry of God that ye may be able to stand against the wilds of the devil for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness in this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, pull out all the weapons, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shot with the preparation of the gospel of peace above all taking the shield of faith if you haven't noticed he's talking about all the weapons of light you see that wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the devil verse 17 and final and take the helmet of salvation the sword of the spirit which is the word of god these are the weapons of light. The weapons of light belong to the soldier of light. In 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 5. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 5. We read, Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night. They that are drunks are drunk in the night. Let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love for a helmet, a hope of salvation. Here we go with the armament again, the weapons. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. We translate verse 12 as, The night has long been on its way. The day has arrived. Therefore, let us at once and once for all shake off the works of darkness. Let us at once and once for all clothe ourselves with the weapons of life. And then walk virtuous. Verse 13. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, <clears throat> not in strife and envy. Honestly, that's a strange translation of that word. Eushemos is the word the you is good, and then the the following part of it is scheme. So it would be well formed, decorously. Walk is peripateo, very common. To conduct oneself and order one's behavior. Paul likes that phrase, walk. He uses it 33 times in his letters. You say, so what? Well, no one else did. In the pastoral epistles, you won't find that word walk. The idea of conducting ourselves properly is seen in the fact that Paul is exhorting the believers to behave in a Christ-like manner in our actions toward the world. 
They should conduct themselves in a manner befitting their high station. Then he lists the specific activities that we should avoid. Rioting, comos, wild behavior, carousing. Greek writers use that to describe nocturnal disorderly procession of dr drunken guys, loud after supper, parading through the streets, looking for other men to join them and other women to join them, says Thayer. Chamberlain is coiti, which is sexual intercourse. And Alfred points out this is used in the bad sense of that word, not the normal natural, but the act itself being a defilement when unsanctified by God's ordinance of marriage. Then wantonness, from the Greek word unbridled lust, excess, licentiousness, shameless, being rude. Then he lists strife and envy, curious. Envying is zelos, which gives us our word jealousy, um, an envious, uh, contentious rivalry. Curiously, the word strife and envy in this verse are both in the singular, whereas the other words are in the plural. When you've got time, think about that and let's go <coughs> wait victoriously. Verse 14. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ, made not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. Finally, victory demands that the believer act. He's to clothe himself with the Lord Jesus Christ. Is not to stop and make provision, forethought, for the flesh to arouse desires that which God has forbidden. That word lust is the Greek word for craving, passionate desire. And it can be used good or bad, but here Gifford says, this is obviously in the bad use of lust. Make no provision. Provision. Pro before. Vision. See. Ah. Provision is looking ahead. What you need. Um, it's pronia in the, in the Greek language. And it's used um, only here and in the book of Acts 24, verse 2, where it says, and there was called forth Peturus, made it, accuse him, saying, See that by thee we enjoy quietness, that very worthy deeds are done to this nation by the providence. Pro vision, providence. It's used only twice in the entire Bible. It was these last two verses, and I close with this. Um, in chapter 13 that spoke so loudly to the heart of Augustine of Hippo. He spent years struggling with his fleshly nature. As a young man, he was a vile creature. He brought shame on his name, on his family. But when he came to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, he was so frightful that he'd go back into those fleshly lusts. When he read Romans chapter 13, verses 13 and 14. The Spirit of God opened his eyes to see that the power for victory wasn't found within his own abilities, but in his identification with Jesus. He walked through town and he saw a woman that he had known years back in sin. And when he saw her, he started to run away, started dashing off, and she yelled, Augustine, Augustine, why do you run? It's I. He ran harder and cried, I ran, I run, because it's no longer me. It's Christ who lives within us. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for these men and their commitment to your word. I pray now, Father, that you might guide us and direct us, that these things that we've learned might touch our heart and strengthen us. For it's in Christ's own name, the name of Jesus.